Hi everyone, my name is Brandon Rodriguez from the Jet Propulsion Lab at uh, NASA's uh, JPL in California. Thanks so much for, for joining us today. As you can see, I'm not truly at JPL as we still uh, wrestle with uh, the uh, pandemic. So we're, we're working from home, uh, but that doesn't mean we can't bring you guys some exciting science and uh, all the latest happenings out of JPL. Um, because uh, we're you know, working in these, in these crazy times, um, Really what we're excited about in the education department at JPL is bringing you guys a little bit of a um, kind of a new flavor to some of these workshops. Maybe before the really exciting uh, Perseverance launch that you saw back in July, um, you subscribed to a few of these and, and tuned in to our three workshops. This is the, the fourth in that series, but we're gonna switch things up a little bit by uh, pairing this up with a second opportunity. Uh, that will be on Saturdays for educators, specifically for K-12 teachers, or um, if you are uh, teaching from home or you're part of a, a camp or something like this, we wanna be able to give you guys the opportunity as we get back to school to take all of the great things that we're going to discuss in our Wednesday sessions and kind of translate that into oppor opportunities for, for you and your kids and your students so we can really have some engaging science in the classroom. Um, even if you're not technically in the classroom. Um, so we'll discuss a little bit about that uh, towards the end where uh, we'll highlight what it is the education department at JPL does, our offerings and how we can hopefully help you. Um, but for today, we wanna kind of just explore uh, NASA in general. And uh, in our fourth session here, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the future of Mars exploration. Um, so again, if you were dialing into some of our previous sessions, we talked a little bit about perseverance, um, just a general overview. We focused one time on just engineering, another time just on science. And today we have an awesome speaker, a good friend of mine, Leonard Ortiz, who is going to talk to us about uh, not just some of those, uh, the highlights and capabilities, but the future of Mars exploration. What can we really look forward to next? Um, if you registered for the uh, Q&A section, uh, I have that open and we'll get a chance to get some Q&A afterwards so that we can kind of, you know, further explore some of these uh, really cool new features of the Perseverance rover and, and our future plans in Mars research. Um, but first, uh, let's let's turn it over to my, my colleague. Uh, Leonard is a, a great, great uh, ally to the education office. Um, I actually met him uh, when he came in and asked how he could help which as an educator was the greatest sensation to ever hear because so many scientists and engineers think that they can walk into a classroom and they say, I'm a scientist, how hard can it be to teach a class of uh, eighth graders? Turns out pretty hard. Uh, so uh, he's, he's been such a, a great friend to the education department. We're really lucky to have him. Uh, so let me turn it over to Leonard. Oh, thanks, Brandon. Thanks for that introduction. Um, hi everyone, my name is Leonard Ortiz. I'm a manufacturing engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And today I want to talk to you about a little bit about what I do at JPL, as well as an overview of the Perseverance rover mission. And we'll take a look at the differences of Curiosity and some of the new instruments that we have going on on Perseverance. So uh, as a manufacturing engineer, um, I, um, I get to support the fabrication, the beginning to end process of uh, flight hardware as well as non-flight hardware. So what does that mean exactly, right? Uh, well, I help build parts uh, for space and also for testing here on the ground, uh, something we call mechanical ground support equipment, which is uh, MGSC. So on the uh, first slide, we have a video that I'll be showing you that we can see um, all these small little parts and components that go into building not just the rover, but the crew stage itself. And so all these parts um, have to be qualified and they have to go through an inspection process. And it's actually a pretty long process uh, to get something to be certified to fly. So uh, the Perseverance rover has actually undergone um, you know, quite some time um, being tested and built and assembled and every, all the crazy things that go on. Um, but the best thing about my job, I think, is being able to work with some of the amazing machinists, the technicians, uh, the people behind the scenes, um, and some that you can see right here in front of the scenes um, in the uh, bunny suits at JPL working at the spacecraft assembly facility, which we call um, the clean room. 
So as you can see, uh, there's a lot of like components that go into uh, building a spacecraft. And so uh, getting things to fly is not easy. It's a task that undergoes a lot of testing. And that's one of the things that JPL we do, uh, test, test, test. And so since I've started at JPL back in 2018, um, I've had the opportunity to work on the Perseverance rover on the uh, MGSC side. So I helped uh, with uh, so, uh, some of the configurations of the uh, centrifuge test, as well as the uh, surrogate rover that we use for testing and alignment of the crew stage stack up. Uh, so that's kind of a little bit about me, um, but for the most of the presentation, we'll be talking about the uh, Perseverance rover and what is new and the, some of the, the similarities between that and Curiosity. So if you go to slide two, uh, we can see here that uh, we didn't just build the rover just now. You know, we've had a long running of building Mars rovers for a few decades now. So actually, we started with the uh, what we call the Pathfinder mission, which was one of the uh, first rovers to rove on Mars back in 1997. That one was a tech demonstration to see if we can actually uh, communicate with something that's moving on Mars, as well as travel and rove on the surface of Mars. Um, and then from there, we now have uh, the kind of Perseverance rover, right? But it took some time to get to this point. Uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers, the uh, Sparing Opportunity, those were our main bread and butter of uh, the engineering behind these rovers, right? We had the tools, we had the, the wheels, and so what we call the uh, rocker bogey system, uh, which now we've used uh, so many times that uh, we are able to rove safely on the surface of Mars. And, uh, but Sparing Opportunity, um, as you can see, they use solar, uh, solar panels, right? And so the Curiosity rover, once we built that, we iterated those, uh, the energy system to be able to use the, uh, what we call the MMRTG, which is the multi-mission uh, multi radioisotope thermal uh, generator, <laughs> thermal electric generator. And so with the MMRTG, uh, we're able to use what we call a nuclear power to power the rover, convert the energy into heat and keep the rover fully functioning. And then from the Curiosity rover using that, we went uh, and used that same system into the Perseverance rover to be able to power that. And so if you go to uh, slide three, here we can see the mission timeline, right? We just launched on July 30th, a few weeks ago, and we are on our way to Mars. We will be landing on February 18th, 2021. And so that's gonna be a really exciting time. Um, we will be, going through our EDL stage, which is the entry, descent, landing, which if you haven't seen the Curiosity uh, Seven Minutes of Terror, I suggest you look that up. It's really, really terrifying uh, how we land on the surface of Mars now with the one-ton rover, uh, but that's something that we'll be repeating, right? And so, uh, but you might be asking, why are we going to Mars? Don't we already have a rover there? Uh, we do, right? But Curiosity, uh, isn't wasn't made to actually look for uh, ancient past life. It was there to study the geology and see if Mars was once ha was once ha um, habitable, right? But Perseverance is actually going to be looking uh, for microbial life, the biosignatures of ancient life, and to finally put to rest is to find out if we are alone. And that's a very 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 scary question, but something that we are excited to uh, do and find out. Uh, so we'll be landing at Jezor Crater. If you look at slide four, uh, this is an ancient delta, which we once thought um, to have a body of water. So where we'll be landing is where the inflow of water is. And there's actually, the crater has inflow and outflow. So we believe at one point this crater was filled of water. And so we'll be going there to see and study the soils and the, uh, the rocks to see if uh, it once contained uh, life. So some of the uh, new instruments on the Perseverance rover um, are not like the Curiosity rover. If you go to slide seven, we can see a side-by-side -side comparison of Curiosity and Perseverance. And at first you might be thinking, well, these rovers look exactly identical. Um, yeah, they kind of do the chassis and the body, um, you know, the, the full frame of the rover is pretty much identical, something that we didn't really want to redesign and go through the whole process again. But if you look closely, you know, especially at the wheels and some of the, uh, 
the instruments on the arm, you can see some of the uh, differences. All right, so if you look at the wheels on slide eight, this is where we can see the main difference of the Curiosity rovers, uh, just for, you know, like from afar. So the wheels, we actually increased the diameter by about 0.7 inches. We narrowed it down a little bit, and then we redesigned the treads on these. The treads before on Curiosity, they were the uh, these are called the chevron design, right? And the chevron design has kind of like a, a zigzag pointed edge um, tread, which over time, if you haven't heard, uh, this caused uh, some some harm and it caused some cracking right in the middle of the wheel. So we went back to the to the drawing board. We uh, went through iterations of designs using 3D printing as well to figure out um, what size thread, what size, uh, what length, what thickness, and what uh, you know what design would be more most optimal for the new wheels. So we ended up with uh, the new wheel that you see on your right. And so with this wheel, uh, we tested in, a, in, in what we call the Mars Yard at JPL. And so at the Mars Yard, we went through uh, so many different tests to see if this wheel will actually would actually endure. And yeah, uh, we tested and we saw that it, would, it did endure and it's now on its way to Mars. So it's really, really exciting uh, to see something like this, uh, you know, going from something like a design that we've used in the past, but redesign, reiterate. And that's kind of what engineering is, right? We focus on um, trying to see what is most efficient and most optimal, but then we see that, you know, there's a little bit of failures, but like along the way, we figure out how to make things better. And, you know, failure um, sometimes is an option, but we pick back up and we redesign and we optimize. Um, so, uh, you know, so something um, that I do from, um, you know, for my job is that um, as a manufacturing engineer, we get to focus on the uh, kind of like the machining part of the components, right? So if you look at the clip, the, um, at the first clip, you can see uh, some of this uh, machining happening, right? Uh, there is a little portion where you could see. Um, so what we do is we take a huge block of metal. And a huge block of metal, we go through a concept called subtractive manufacturing. And subtractive manufacturing is, um, you know, taking this chunk of metal, cutting it into the design that we uh, most desire for, in this case, is the wheel. And so taking that chunk of metal, uh, getting to where we want, is um, something we, we also call build to print, right? So we get a blueprint and with uh, GDNT, which is uh, geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. We are able to work with uh, designers, project engineers, and be able to uh, make these parts come to life. And that's kind of like one of the most rewarding parts of my job, I, I believe, is being able to see something go from paper to an actual physical object. And it's kind of crazy to think about. But yeah, that's kind of uh, something that I get to do uh, in my daily activities, you know, see things come to life. Um, now we're going to go back to um, talking about the perseverance and curiosity. Uh, differences, right? If you go to uh, slide nine, we can see that some of the uh, new instruments on the rover uh, are on the turret. Uh, we also have uh, 23 cameras versus Curiosity had 17 cameras. And um, the one of the coolest ones and the coolest systems on this Perseverance rover that will pave the way for future human exploration and robotic exploration is the uh, sample caching system. And that's what I'm most excited to talk to you about but we're gonna have to wait a little bit. First, we're gonna go through some of the uh, cameras on this system. So if you go to slide 10, we can see the uh, two of the main instruments um, on board, Sherlock and Pixel. These two will actually be the two that will uh, be most vital to uh, finding signs of ancient life, right? And then if you go to slide 17, here we can see um, exactly what Sherlock and Pixel are going to uh, try to find, right? So Sherlock is going to be looking for uh, carbon-based minerals and organic molecules, while Pixel is going to be using X-ray um, spectrometer to find um, composites of um, elements, and it's actually um, rated to find uh, um, over 20 uh, chemical elements. So with these two instruments combined, we'll be able to find uh, 
and and see if you know Mars had at one point life. And so what we're looking for is actually microbial life. And so uh, Sherlock is the instrument that, um, as you can see in the above image, uh, Sherlock is looking for those biosignatures and kind of like the uh, the fingerprints of Mars. So by looking for the fingerprint, you can see and date back to at w which point if there was or is life there on the surface of Mars. So now if you uh, if you go back to the Perseverance rover cameras, uh, slide 10, you can see also the, some of the new instruments uh, on board, uh, like the uh, cameras, right? So the cameras are actually uh, some of the coolest cameras that we're going to have on the surface of Mars. Uh, these are actually rated now to uh, 20 megapixels. And we actually have a video camera that we'll be using uh, when landing on the surface of Mars, which is going to be super crazy because we're actually going to be able to take video of us landing and seeing exactly um, how this all works because we've had images before from Curiosity. But this time, we're actually going to be able to uh, see in full definition of uh, this whole EDL process. Uh, so if you go to slide 11, here you can see uh, where the camera is going to be at. So from when we enter the atmosphere at 13,000 miles per hour, um, and once the heat shield pops off, uh, the rover uh, will, be, will start recording, and we'll be able to see frame by frame uh, how the whole EDL process is. And that's something really uh, to look forward to, because uh, before, you know, it was just still images, and we have the uh, computer-generated video that we have, um, which will also be soon, uh, which will, you know, which will also be coming soon for the Perseverance rover. Um, but with the video, it's going to be so much better. And so, um, with the, uh, if you go back to the cameras, uh, slide 10, we could also see the, uh, we have a couple other cameras. The uh, front has cameras, the rear has cameras. Um, these will help uh, uh, Perseverance um, kind of keep away from all the hazards, rocks, right? They're all, uh, so they're called hazardous cameras, um, but has counts for short. And so actually one of the things that I got to work on when I first started at JPL um, was to support the fabrication of the has caps, um, working on small components, um, qualifying them to get ready to fly on Mars, which is a uh, one of the coolest things that, I, you know, um, at least for me, uh, always wanting to work at JPL, um, I got a chance to do. And to me, when I started, I was still just mind blown that I was able to work there. And so, um, yeah, if you go to uh, it's slide 13, um, these are the uh, two other cameras that are similar to uh, Curiosity Rover. Uh, the, the, the Curiosity Rover had uh, the mass cams, but these ones are going to be the MassCam Z. So the MassCam Z actually will be able to take um, longer range photos as well as panorama photos and um, high, and have a higher definition in, um, in imagery to uh, give us a better feel and a, a better sight of the surface of Mars. So we actually will feel like we're there and it's going to be super exciting. Uh, and then we have the uh, SuperCam. The SuperCam is actually um, has a laser on there that will also be looking for organic chemicals and um, elements, um, but they'll actually be using the laser to shoot at rocks that the arm can't reach. So the, actually the arm is only rated to go up to about seven feet um, out, and so there are going to be areas where the arm cannot reach, so we'll be using a super cam to get to those areas. Now, previously on the Curiosity rover, we had what was called the cam cam, which is a, it was a similar concept, you know, be, uh, being able to look at organic compounds and use a laser to get to the areas that we weren't able to. But if you think about it, when we built the Curiosity rover, it was back in the early 2000s, and so, or it was, uh, it started in around 2003, 2004, and it didn't launch until 2011. So that technology, uh, when we started building it, was from the early 2000s. Um, but it's kind of the same thing with the Perseverance rover. When we started building it, it was in the early 2010s. Um, so this new technology isn't really as new as we would like to, but it's something that we're going to be working with, and we're super excited to get the science back. So if you go to slide 14, slide 14 shows 
I know like a, a rendition of what we'll be, you know, like using the SuperCam for. Be zapping rocks about 20 feet away and being able to pick up those and study those rocks, um, you know, uh, yes, yeah, study the rocks for organic chemicals. Uh, so that's gonna be super exciting. Uh, and alongside with the, the cameras, if you go to slide 15, um, we're actually gonna have uh, two microphones on the rover to be able to listen to not only the winds of Mars, but also be able to listen to our instruments working on, on the surface of Mars. Uh, previously, when we tested, for example, when we tested the SuperCam, you know, it, when it zaps the rocks, it's, it makes a lot of like zapping noise. So uh, being able to hear that on the surface is gonna be uh, incredible. And you know, I'm sure all the, the people from the, the SuperCam team uh, cannot wait to get there. And um, as well, uh, so we also have a another camera, or I guess a radar that we have on the uh, butt of the rover. It's going to be, uh, if you go to slide 18, uh, this is called the RIMFAX. So the RIMFAX is going to be looking at the subsurface of Mars. Uh, so as we are roving through the surface, We'll be collecting data and seeing uh, to see if there's any geological features um, under the surface that we can look at, uh, and then we'll, uh, you know, this will also help us kind of um, understand more of Mars as we rove along without any interference of any of the other instruments. And then, so along with those cameras and microphones, we will also have, um, if you go to slide 19, we have a weather station called Meta. And this weather station will be taking the temperature, humidity, and um, the, the speed of the wind. And so we'll actually kind of be able to uh, finally understand how the weather on Mars works. So, and if you go to uh, slide 20, we can see uh, this uh, quick video of the uh, Mars Perseverance uh, robotic arm uh, doing a bicep curl. And so one of the exciting things that I got to work on uh, on the MGSC side of the Perseverance rover was um, testing of the robotic, what we call the robotic arm mass model. So what that means is uh, um, we took the same, the exact same structure and the exact same weight of the robotic arm that we use on the flight model, but we use this on the, uh, what we call the development test model um, which is a DTM uh, unit of the Perseverance rover. So if you didn't know, um, we typically at JPL, we make uh, two, two rovers, right? One's for flight and then one's for testing. Um, there are other uh, components to the other rovers that we do make, like the Scarecrow, but for the most part, we make two. Um, and the, the, the flight unit, obviously we can't do all the testing that we'd like to, because if it, you know anything does happen to that rover, then you know, we'd be screwed. But with the uh, development test model, we are able to put that uh, through the tests and to see if it would uh, injure some of the uh, testing that we do. So for the DTM rover, one of the uh, tests that I was a part of was the uh, centrifuge test, which we tested um, the the entry of the Perseverance rover coming into the uh, into the atmosphere of Mars. So with the centrifuge test, we rated this at, uh, I think it was about 13 to 15 Gs, whereas um, the from the data that we collected from Curiosity, uh, we're only rated uh, to go at uh, 9 Gs um, entering to the surface of Mars. So we bumped it up a little bit to see if our our uh, our rover would would stand that force going into um, you know into the surface, which is a pretty incredible thing to be able to do um, without you know having tested the actual flight unit. But um, a lot of things go into testing and we only get one shot. So we have to make sure that everything is done right and done correctly and also uh, rated more than we're supposed to. So it, just in case of anything, um, we can withstand that much more power and that, more, you know, like that much more strength. Um, but the, the exciting thing that I'm, uh, well, the, the most thing I'm excited for for the Perseverance rover is actually the uh, sample caching system. So the sample caching system is actually going to be what will be paving the way for future robotic exploration. Um, so we actually have um, a system that will be collecting samples. So collecting the samples from the robotic arm 
putting it into the bit carousel and then um, tr you know transferring those the soil samples and then um, uh, kind of depositing them on the surface for a future Mars mission uh, that we call the Mars Sample Return Mission. And um, if you go to slide 22, you can see the Mars, uh, the, the sample caching system is right in front of the rover. So it's actually, um, if you think about it, we actually have uh, three robots on, on, on Perseverance. One is the robotic arm, the second is the bit carousel that rotates the soil samples from a horizontal point to a vertical point, and then as well as the, uh, the shaw, which the shaw is the sample handling arm at the bottom of the rover. So the uh, shaw will um, pick up the, the samples that the, um, that the robotic arm has um, put into it, and then it'll move it. And so we're actually going to have 43 sample tubes, um, five witness tubes, which the five witness tubes are preloaded with material that will help us um, detect any contaminants in the environment of which we collect those samples in. And so, um, you know, like, uh, so like during those, those witness samples, we'll be able to use those um, and deposit those along with the extra pile that we'll be um, depositing those, those samples in. And uh, those witness tubes will help us see if there's anything that we've brought to the surface of Mars that's on the rover, anything, um, you know, any contaminant, any chemicals, anything that the rover has deposited. And so if you go to slide 23, this shows the, the uh, Mars sample kind of caching system, or the, uh, sorry, the, the uh, depot um, case that will hopefully be returning to uh, Mars in a crazy mission that has uh, collaborators such as the European Space Agency um, and others. Uh, so what we're going to be trying to do is uh, take an orbiter, um, a lander, and a rover to pick these samples up and bring them back to Earth. And the reason why we're bringing them back to Earth is we we can't take the best uh, you know laboratories, the best chemists, uh, the best scientists to Mars. So why not bring them to Earth, bring the samples to Earth so we can study those here. And so then we'll have the uh, best scientists, the best uh, laboratories working on these, and we'll be able to analyze those samples in a much closer uh, and uh, with higher rated um, machinery so that we'll be able to actually see if there is signs of life. Um, but then you might also be asking like, um, how is this uh, rover being powered? So just like the Curiosity rover, uh, the Perseverance rover is part of uh, something I mentioned earlier, the, the, the MMRTG, um, which is at the end of the rover, uh, which is rated to 110 watts. And this will um, help power the entire rover and, um, during its mission and give power to all the instruments that are on board. Um, and also you might be asking something that uh, we never really talk about, and I don't know if, some, I mean, if people have asked, but um, why is the rover painted white, right? So actually at uh, JPL, um, we tend to paint our rovers white to help with the um, with uh, thermal uh, properties and also keeping the rover warm inside um, and uh, also reflecting the sun back out. That's also one of the reasons why we don't have the wheels painted white because uh, there's no real need to. There's no um, instruments inside of the wheels, uh, um, except for the motors, but the motors are already taken care of. So uh, if you go to slide 26, um, we can see the, uh, the entry, descent, and landing uh, phase. Uh, so for the new rover, we actually have um, terrain relative navigation system that will help the rover um, get to the area that it needs to safely. So we have a new technology and along with the, uh, the, the cameras on board that will be taking snapshots of the terrain as it's lowered onto the surface of Mars. Um, unlike before, the Curiosity rover did not have this technology. So uh, Jezero Crater is actually known as a hazardous area, which we weren't able to land before. But now with this technology, we actually are. And so that's one of the uh, new cool instruments and new technology that we're actually able to implement this time around. So um, kind of like something I've been kind of talking about is, is uh, the, the technology keeps advancing. So 
as we get further and further along, we'll be able to, um, you know, get make new technology and use it to for future Mars exploration missions, which is really exciting because uh, the Mars sample return is actually, um, I think for, the, there's no exact date, but it's it's supposed to launch sometime around 2026 and um, hopefully return those samples in 2030s. Um, but it's still kind of up in the air. It's still in the uh, campaign phase. Um, but so uh, I guess we can take a look at uh, slide 33, which uh, will be um, this. So we'll be, uh, yeah, so we'll be communicating with the Mars Perseverance rover through a deep space network. And so what this allows us to do is, is, uh, is, is, um, is communicate with our orbiters. Uh, so we have a few orbiters on, um, on Mars. Um, actually, one is from the European Space Agency, and the other one is the Mars Reconnaissance or, um, um, Orbiter, which is the MRO. And so we'll, we'll, so we'll be able to communicate with those orbiters. Um, once uh, Perseverance lands, um, it'll connect and communicate with the orbiters, and from the orbiters, we'll relay that message uh, over to us. But one of the most challenging things is, uh, yeah, communicating with our rovers on Mars. You know, it, it takes about a 14 minute, um, you know, like relay delay going from there uh, and then back to Mars or there and then back to Earth. Um, so uh, hopefully when we do kind of advance more of the uh, technology, we'll be able to communicate a little bit uh, faster and better. And actually one of the uh, uh, new uh, programs that I'm a part of is called uh, DSOC, which is a Deep Space Optical Communications which will be uh, hopefully improving the communication between uh, Earth and deep space, which is also, it's also really exciting uh, to see and to uh, kind of be a part of at JPL. Um, so, um, what, like, so, so one of the last things I kind of want to talk about before I uh, miss it, and we're kind of like running short on time, is the, uh, the Mars helicopter. So if you go to slide 35, um, the Coolest thing, the cherry on top to this whole Perseverance mission is uh, that won't really interfere with the actual uh, objectives of Perseverance is the Mars helicopter, which is Ingenuity. So the Mars helicopter um, will be deployed um, a few months after landing on, on, on Mars. And uh, as soon as uh, Perseverance is about, uh, I think, 100 meters away, um, the helicopter will be able to uh, start flying. And hopefully we'll be able to get uh, some data back to see how uh, a a copter kind of can fly on Mars with the, such a low density of atmosphere, which is uh, one percent that of Earth's. And uh, so that the helicopter will be actually be flying for ninety seconds at a time, and it is uh, is about the the wings are about uh, four feet, uh, has uh, two blades, and it's supposed to spin about uh, twenty four hundred RPM. And so this uh, four pound copter will be the, the uh, first powered flight uh, on another planet. And that's uh, really, really exciting to see because um, this isn't uh, you know, interfering at all with the Mars Perseverance rover. It's actually adding to the uh, mission, being able to use the uh, two cameras on the copter to be able to see um, further than the you know, rover can see. So this is really exciting. And all this is happening uh, in February 18th, 2021. Um, as soon as we land, um, it's gonna be uh, such an amazing uh, feeling and moments. And it's gonna be uh, a time in history that we'll be able to look back at and say that, wow, we built this, we helped make this, but it's not just at us at JPL. You know, everybody around the world um, is kind of all part of this entire mission. And uh, for future missions to come uh, to come out of this, uh, you know, we can't wait to see what else, what sciences, and what what comes out of this entire mission. So if you go to uh, slide, I guess 38. Um, if you guys want to um, go to mars.nasa.gov/mars2020, uh, this is where you can find more information on the Mars Perseverance rover. Or if you just want to look uh, at more information just about Mars in general. You know, you can go to nasa.gov slash Mars. And that's it for me. Thanks to everybody. Awesome. Really appreciate this. Uh, I mean, so, so many things to like dig deeper in, right? I mean, this is just a, a highlight reel 
uh, for so many, you know, uh, real uh, interesting topics for us to kind of dig, dig further into. Um, just some quick notes. I, I really appreciate uh, you talking about Mars sample return. I know that that's still, you know, conceptual at this point. And, but uh, I, I feel like in the last couple of years, we've seen all this talk of let's go to Mars, let's send people to Mars. Um, but JPL is, is taking a little bit more of this, you know, why? Why send people when you can send robots and, and bring Mars back to us? And I think that that just makes so much uh, sense. Um, and another thing I, I thought was really interesting that you highlighted is uh, this idea of subtractive engineering. Um, I think a lot of people don't understand that, you know, you don't, you don't go to a hardware store and pick up the parts for a rover, mm -hmm. right? These, these right. need to be made in-house. Um, I have a small little desktop model of uh, the uh, Perseverance, and it's a one-tenth scale, but I kind of can't grasp how big this truly is. Um, so I also have actually a, a wheel. Um, so this is what this is what uh, what what Leonard makes, right? Yeah. Um, so to, to kind of get a, a feel for for the the scale of this thing, it's a uh, it's it's really pretty wild. Um, so we, we have a ton of questions, uh, some really, really good questions to kind of go through. Um, the, the first one uh, is if you can comment a little bit about how much of the campaign for Perseverance is already planned out. You know, what, what's the level of flexibility um, or is this kind of uh, already mapped out to the day? Yeah, so the Perseverance campaign is actually, um, it's, it is mapped out in a way where um, right now there are folks um, doing, um, you know, like surface operations where they're getting ready to do all the science uh, that is required of the Perseverance rover once they land on Mars. However, um, you know, once we land on Mars, there's going to be some flexibility of uh, what actually needs to happen. And if there is any, if there are any issues with some of the instruments, then that kind of takes uh, a planning, right? So there's always going to be, um, you know, planning um, along the way. And as well as you know, to to make sure that for first uh, that all the instruments are actually working and um, alive. You know, first we have to see how the Perseverance rover is operating, and see if um, if you know if all the instruments are well and alive and to be able to do their operations. But for the most part, um, there are a lot of like engineers already working on on their schedule, and as soon as the rover lands, um, at, at least as soon as we get closer to the landing date we'll have a better uh, idea of the uh, actual planning behind these operations. But uh, again, you know, sometimes things don't go as planned. And, you know, as as we all know, we're human, so we adapt to the situation. So we will be able to uh, adapt to whatever comes our way and figure it out. As engineers, we like to solve problems. So that's, what we'll, we'll, that's what we'll be doing. Yeah, I think it's a Mike Tyson quote, says everyone has a plan until we get punched in the face, right? <laughs> Got to get there and reevaluate yeah. and see how we're doing. Hopefully, we don't get punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, several questions from uh, Mary Hill Elementary. Uh, they're they're kind of asking about Jezero Crater in particular. You know, we're there because we thought water was once there. Are there signs of water on Mars already? Do we know that it's there? So there um, are, but right now we are looking at the uh, polar caps. So there is. Um, there's ice beneath the surface, or um, also some on the surface, but it it, um, it tends to evaporate uh, you know, rather quickly. Uh, so, uh, seeing that there is ice, uh, we uh, kind of concluded to that being water, but there's not actually uh, flowing water. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we also want to um, investigate uh, the subsurface to be able to see um, what is um, underneath the Jezero crater, right? Uh, to be able to go to towards that area and um, kind of get the 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 sediments of rocks and and see um, you know if there is life, but there has been some uh, you know some research that has been done and some some analysis that uh, there once was water um, you know flowing, so we we believe and we are going to the uh, the the sciences to to go there and to figure out uh, once and for all if there is life. And if there was once water. Yeah, that kind of leads well into a, 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 another great question uh, Cristobal asked, which is, you know, here you are a, a manufacturing engineer asking and answering questions about, you know, the scientific instruments, about the geology on Mars. You know, it, it's, it seems like 
um, JPLers have this this wild, broad knowledge, right? I mean, this is certainly beyond your you know original skill set. So, can you comment a little bit about how it is that you, in your role, communicate with other disciplines at NASA and JPL? Yeah. So, uh, my role, you know, as a manufacturing engineer, um, we uh, kind of deal with the uh, mechanical and physical hardware of things, right? But um, I would say, uh, kind of like through my curiosity uh, and through, I mean, because it's kind of, you know, kind of how, how you said, um, JPLers tend to kind of uh, open the spectrum and to broaden their knowledge of things is because I believe we're all curious and we all like to kind of know a little bit of everything and kind of our, our minds go to where we uh, find interest in, right? So at least for me, um, I found interest in Mars kind of at an earlier age. Um, before this, uh, before JPL, I was actually a part of another rover team uh, during my undergrad. Uh, so I was part of the Titan rover. So that's that was kind of my first introduction into um, getting then diving into uh, what Mars is about. So over time, just kind of me being curious and I was wanting to uh, know everything and, you know, um, obviously and, and also be challenged on how to even get to Mars and, and do science there. Um, it kind of opened my mind to be able to or to want to um, know these things. So now it's kind of outside of my my role, but it's also something that I was just um, kind of liked to do and, and learn and know. Yeah, and in a similar vein, do you have advice for kind of young students? We have several, you know, en engineers to be on the on the stream right now, um, and they're asking questions like, you know, what what do we need to pursue? How can we be part of this pretty exciting future of Mars exploration? So, any kind of career tips or how you got to where you are? Yeah, so to be, I um, mean, part of the, you know, I guess I would say the. Uh, this uh, Mars Exploration Society, uh, you don't necessarily need to be an engineer. Um, I know a lot of folks who aren't engineers, but are also uh, part of this whole uh, endeavor, kind of like Brandon, you know, like, you're, like you yourself, you're um, from the educational office and you're, you're in this the space industry, the space program. Um, so it's kind of, uh, as I, my take would be, you know, just follow your passion, follow your dreams. Um, that's kind of what I did. Um, I didn't really start uh, by like looking up this, you know, like looking up at the stars. Like most people uh, have this story of like, hey, I, I was a little kid, I was looking up the stars, and now I'm here at JPL. Uh, actually, mine started off uh, like a little later, um, but I did have an interest in engineering. Uh, kind of a funny story is uh, my dad. He he was a bodybuilder um, when he lived in Mexico, and so um, he had one of his idols was Arnold Schwarzenegger. And so when I was um, at a young age, I watched the Terminator. And so the first scene uh, that I saw the uh, that skeletal hand move, and I saw all the uh, intricate you know mechanisms working there, that kind of sparked my my curiosity and and trying to understand how is that working? Like why are these uh, AI robots uh, able to move and function? So that was my first interest in 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 um, in engineering per se. Uh, but then later on, um, once I graduated college, or sorry, once I graduated high school, I actually uh, first, th that's when I first um, heard of and saw the Curiosity rover launching. And uh, when it landed and I saw that Seven Minutes of Terror video, that's, that was the moment that, uh, that kind of led me into the path to working at JPL. Um, after seeing uh, that Seven Minutes of Terror video, um, it, it made me want to challenge myself and to see, um, you know, like one of the things I always ask myself, like, what is the most hardest thing to do? Like, what's the most challenging thing? And I think uh, space exploration is definitely up there. And so, um, you know, I like to challenge myself. And so what, what I did, I just, you know, kind of stuck to my guns and, and started down the path to uh, trying to work at JPL. Um, and eventually, you know, over time, um, I did a couple of internships, not at JPL, but other places, trying to get an experience. Um, I worked uh, full time, uh, not in the space industry, and it wasn't until 2018 that I actually got picked up by JPL. Um, but just over time, I just kept applying, I kept uh, persevering through, and uh, eventually, you know, like my uh, my passion, my, my goal, kind of shown, uh, you know, like it kind of showed through. 
um, during my interviews and yeah and now I'm here at JPL it's so uh, the biggest key takeaway I, I would say is just you know follow your dreams uh, follow your passion and just keep on going keep um, tackling at it and persevere yeah that's I mean incredible to hear because I think a lot of people don't understand how diverse the skill set is at NASA not just within science um, but you know, as, as an organization that's so public facing, we need the best writers, we need the best web designers, we need so many different skill sets to be able to communicate uh, what it is that you do with the public. Um, and then I also noticed that, uh, I think everyone here heard it first, that if Skynet goes active, we have, we have Leonard to blame, that he uh, <laughs> very motivated by, by the, the destruction of humanity. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, another question that, uh, this is a, a tough one, but maybe you can comment at least on the process. Um, do you know of uh, any instruments that were, you know, kind of hopeful to make it on the Perseverance rover, uh, but maybe got cut due to cost or weight? Um, and if not, then just, you know, what does that evaluation process look like? Ooh, uh, that's actually a really good question. I actually don't know which ones got cut, but I know some of these instruments um, have been um, kind of, talked about for a long time trying to get onto uh, the Perseverance rover uh, and, and previous rovers as well. I know the sample caching system, um, at least for the Mars sample return campaign, has been um, you know decades worth of, uh, of work. Um, but uh, as far as the ones that have been cut, I'm not really sure. But there is a, a process that um, that a lot of uh, or uh, some agencies and companies uh, do try to um, kind of negotiate to get onto the Perseverance rover. If you did not know, uh, some of the instruments aren't um, all from, from JPL, from the US. We uh, test and assemble them here, but we don't necessarily uh, build all of them. There is um, a few that are from France and Spain. Um, so the Perseverance is actually a, coll um, a collaboration between a lot of countries and a lot of people, a lot of scientists. So that's also why another reason um, why, it, you know, like what makes Perseverance uh, such a good um, Roverx is not just for the, the U.S. to to kind of um, flagship on this, but also the entire world. You know, it's not the science isn't going to be just for us. It's going to be for everybody to know and understand. Um, I have uh, well, one last question for you before we before we go and switch to some uh, talk on the education side. Um, there are some uh, rumors here about uh, some sort of uh, uh, Morse code imprinting on Mars. Uh, can you kind of uh, explain that that folklore and uh, that tale? The uh, yeah, the Morse code. Uh, are you talking about the Curiosity rover yeah. or the uh, Perseverance? There is some on the Perseverance as well. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so the so the Curiosity rover. Um, essentially, uh, the engineers um, that were working on the wheel uh, at one point uh, wanted to put um, the letters JPL onto the wheel um, without kind of getting NASA's approval. And so what happened is uh, um, they didn't get the approval. So then they put um, what is now what's Morse code for JPL, but they put these imprints um, into the Curiosity wheel. And their explanation was uh, this will help us kind of measure and track um, the distance from which the Curiosity rover is traveling. A little didn't uh, the folks at NASA know that this these imprints are actually in a Morse code for JPL, and so that's kind of the uh, folklore of uh, you know getting things um, onto the rover without uh, people knowing. And there's actually a couple of things on uh, well, one mainly on Perseverance. Uh, actually, the the emblem of the of um, the Mars, Sun, Earth uh, next to next to uh, I believe uh, is it 10 million. Um, people that signed up to go uh, get their name sent to Mars. And so it's right there on the emblem. Um, not really sure, I forget exactly what it stands for, but um, yeah, JPLers tend to sneak in things onto the Perseverance rover. It kind of makes it a little fun for, for, for everybody, you know, not just for us, but uh, people down the line to talk about things like this. Yeah, it's definitely my my favorite story of all of the, like the crazy JPL antics. It just Coming in and, and working here just showed me these are the the bad boys and girls of, of nerd stars. <laughs> so, 
So. Yeah, I mean, essentially, we're all kind of just kids working in like a hobby shop, I, I would say, you know, kind of tinkering with the uh, tools and toys and seeing what works, what doesn't work. Um, but ultimately, you know, trying to create science and instruments that will actually uh, pave the way for for future, you know, exploration and, and things to um, get that data and science back. But in the end, yeah, we're just I feel like we're just all kids and and it's really really fun to be part of a uh, JPL you know, it's like uh, one of the it's like a dream come true to be able to just you know, tinker with things and you know uh, yeah it's, you just feel like a, a kid at a toy store <laughs> uh, well thank you so much for taking the time today we really really appreciate it um, always interesting to, to hear just how again how crazy and uh, novel and um, how collaborative all of these projects are all on one uh, on one rover uh, so hopefully that gives our, our viewers uh, something to kind of look forward to and look into a little bit more. Um, so uh, I, I thank you so much for your time. We'll, we'll definitely chat soon and um, really appreciate you joining us today. Great. Thanks for having me. Uh, so we'll close out the uh, rest of the call uh, just by uh, looking at a little bit about some of the educational resources that you can uh, utilize to take what you heard Leonard talk about today, again, to your home, to your classroom. Um, or if you're just uh, passionate about science. Uh, so uh, what you'll see here on this uh, first slide is uh, kind of the landing spot for the JPL education page. At the top, you'll see some options for ways for you to explore. Some of them um, more educator focused, some of them for you know uh, the, the just science enthusiast. Um, maybe the events section that you see at the top is how you found this uh, uh, session today. So that'll give you a little lineup of what we're doing and where we are. Um, on the second slide, you'll see that we have a tons and tons of activities that tie directly to the type of uh, science and engineering you heard Leonard discuss. Marsbound, for example, is a lesson where you design a, uh, a Mars mission on your own. So now that Perseverance is on its way, what will the next one look like? How are you going to power it? What science is it going to do? And this is a really great engineering kind of concept building activity. So, you know, by the time a, uh, an idea gets to manufacturing, there's there's already been discussion. We don't go into the into the um, workshop and start building. We got to know our goals. We got to know our plan. We got to know our blueprint. And that kind of um, models that in Marsbound. Um, on slide three, you'll see um, a little bit more of uh, activities pertaining to, for example, Mars sample return. So this is modeling the um, coring sample and caching. Uh, for this future mission. Again, um, you know, all grade levels being represented, um, explanation for, you know, how this ties in, and then resources for your future reading as well. If you are an educator, um, you'll see on slide four that um, what we try to do in the education department is put these together a little bit for you as well into like a narrative. So instead of just having one-off lessons, you know, what if there were, you know, six or seven lessons in a row that you could do such as a mission to Mars unit. So instead of just landing or just doing science or just building, you know, what, what does it really take to get from start to finish? Um, on slide five, you'll see uh, uh, some examples of the kind of news that's coming out of the education department. Again, written for students, for the, for the casual scientific observer. Um, and this is a good chance for you if you're not a classroom educator, just to stay up to speed. Um, it's it's overwhelming. I'll I'll tell you. Uh, you know, Leonard did a great job answering some of these questions today. But you got to think, it takes a lot of work to to kind of, you know, not just stay too too uh, uh, deep in your tunnel vision on your one topic and being able to understand all of the process around you. Um, and this is just Mars, by the way. You know, we're we're not we haven't even talked about the rest of the solar system or beyond that. So um, staying up to speed can be tough, but this will give you a chance to kind of read about it and, and, and really just stay excited about all the cool things happening in space science. Um, on slide six, uh, my, my teacher types will enjoy going to this teach section. This is written for you guys. Um, this is lesson plans, activities, all um, already in a 5e model if you're a 5e kind of person. I know I am. Um, and worksheets are made, answer keys are already prepared, um, class management tips. The idea is that my team is all uh, uh, ex-educators. We've all taught in the classroom, so we know 
exactly what it is that you guys need. Uh, and the answer isn't thick binders full of things for you to go do. Uh, so instead, what can you just take off the shelf and hit the ground running? Um, because times are what they are, on slide seven, uh, you'll see in the learn section that if you are in like a, a distance learning or remote learning environment, um, these are activities that are written with a little bit more of a student focus. So if you are, uh, you know, want to assign something, or again, if you're just, uh, you know, excited about science and want to try these at home, uh, these are written in a more stepwise format, pictures and directions, so that you can do some of this cool research at home. You'll see drop down menus throughout to allow you guys to kind of pick, you know, what grade level is my, my kid or my students, um, so that you can kind of uh, get it to, to uh, represent the right difficulty level. Um, on slide eight, uh, you'll see how we've kind of compiled that into what we call learning space. And this is, again, all of these kind of features in one place, activities. We're filming video tutorials so that you can watch us kind of run through some of the sample lessons. We're translating everything into Spanish as well, uh, in case you uh, are a Spanish speaker or, or have Spanish speaking students. And then just a FAQ for families as well. So tons and tons of resources here uh, for you, for your family, for your students. Um, and then lastly, on slide nine, uh, you know, again, this is just a, a, a a brief, brief introduction to the resources at JPL. Um, please, please dig deep into this website. I know you're going to love it, uh, no matter your background. Um, and then recall that, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, one of the things that we're really excited about doing is, again, having kind of a, a follow-up session. So on uh, the, the Saturday after today, um, we will, uh, this is posted on the events webpage as well. We, we have registration for a teacher audience in particular to take what it is that we discussed today um, and then kind of implement it in a classroom. So we'll actually model some of these lessons. We'll dig a little bit deeper um, and that should give you guys a, you know, some more context and opportunity to play with what it is you're hoping to share with your kids. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll kind of close out. I thank you guys so much for joining us again today. Um, I hope you enjoyed this, this series. Um, yeah, we will always post these. So if you have a, a friend uh, or a colleague that missed, There'll be uh, the recording will be posted on the education website as well as on YouTube. And uh, we'll do this again next month. You actually heard Leonard talk a little bit about DSOC, um, advancing how it is we communicate with spacecraft. And coincidentally, that will be our topic for next month. So how is it that we communicate with spacecraft literally hundreds of millions of miles away? How are we transmitting data uh, that's getting bigger and bigger? You know, these 20 me megapixel cameras, how do you get these beautiful images back when you're uh, at, at such a great distance? Um, so we'll explore that a little bit as well. So I hope you enjoyed today. I hope to see you next month. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.